Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is your girl Mitzi, and this is Mitzi. Let's think about it. Today, I have a special guest. We are speaking about The Invisible Girl. It's about Yvonne's book that she just published, and she it basically shares the story of sexual abuse and child abuse. Am I right? You are, yes. Awesome. Well, Yvonne, why don't you go ahead and fully introduce yourself? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me. And you're right. My memoir, The Invisible Girl, follows my journey through sexual abuse, incest, domestic violence, as far as witnessing it, parental neglect, parental betrayal. And I wrote the book because it's not just my story. There are 42 million adult survivors in the United States. And I wanted to be a beacon of hope for them that you can go through some really traumatic, repeated, horrific abuse and still come out on the other side okay. That we we can get through this. I won't say we'll get through it unscathed, but we <laughs> but we'll get through it. And and so that was the reason why I wrote the book. And when I began my own journey in 2015, I didn't even realize that I was still affected by the trauma that I endured as a child. I didn't realize that I was really experiencing some really severe, normal, negative after effects from abuse. And I say normal because when you've endured abuse, it is normal that you have these after effects. And a lot of people will beat themselves up over it. And I just want people to have compassion for themselves, compassion for what they've been through, and just know that they can do this. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that is very true. And I'm glad that you were able to do that because just last year, I actually interviewed two individuals. They wanted to stay anonymous because they were still traumatized by that situation of incest and sexual abuse in the family and things like that. And when they shared their story, it still affected them speaking. It was as if it was the first time of them breaking out and just telling somebody else their story of what happened to them. And it was really hard. I had to take a lot of breaks and a lot of pauses so that they can just, you know, ease their way in and really feel comfortable to express that because I truly believe it's important. You know, mm -hmm. it's important to know what's going on in your family and outside and what's going on inside of you. And I applaud you for writing this book and expressing the realness of what it is because no man and no woman is exempt from this. Anybody can be an offender and anybody can be offended by this horrible act. So I greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate that. And you're absolutely right. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, they don't realize, you know, this is something that I talk about, that there's a misconception about children that go through trauma, that they're just resilient. They can bounce back from it. If they're a child, you don't want to talk about it, you know, don't need to bring it up. It's been after all of these years. But what people don't realize is that when it happens, it stays with that victim forever. And in my case, so yeah, so in my particular story, I suffered incest by multiple family members. And, you know, it was really difficult because especially in that situation, you don't know how to deal with it. You know, you think, oh, this is a family member. They're supposed to love me. And, you know, so what they're doing to me must be okay because they love me. And there's so much confusion around it. And, you know, because think about when you grow up and when you go to a party or a celebration, the first thing you do when you run in when you're a kid is give everybody a hug to greet them. If you were anything like my family anyway, you know, <laughs> you know, kids were expected to hug the adults. And that's why I'm now really fighting to really ask parents to change that habit Correct. because, and this really doesn't have anything to do with, you know, because it could be incest in your family, but we have to teach our children that they don't have to hug, you know, aunts, uncles, granny, grandpa, when they go to a celebration, if they don't want to. Kids need to know from a very early age that they own their body. They decide who comes close to them. And that's why it's so important to start early. And I say this, especially with family, because that's where boundaries are really 
built is at home and within the family. And if you have boundaries there, those boundaries will carry on outside of the home as well. And so it's, we don't force our children to hug family members because if they don't want to, they shouldn't have to. And they should know in any situation within an adult, if they don't want to, they don't have to. Mm-hmm. And I think that even in situations where there is incest or potential incest, I would say just pay very close attention. If you ask your child to go hug someone and they don't want to, and they, mm, no, no, that's a sign. Yeah. That's a sign that they're just not comfortable. And we have to respect that. We have to start respecting children's boundaries, I think. Yeah. And I think we need to start with a different perspective as adults to understand there's different ways of acknowledgement because that's exactly how it was in my family. I'm from a Hispanic background. And the biggest thing for us was always to give a hug and a kiss on the cheek. And because that's the respectful way to acknowledge an adult and acknowledge somebody else that was in the room. So Mm -hmm. even if it wasn't family members or not, we were always forced to automatically greet in that manner. And I think that once we realize that that is not the only way, then we can really learn to start respecting each other's boundaries. Because as a child, I remember it was so uncomfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. And I would get yelled at or in trouble because I didn't greet an adult Mm -hmm. and the adult felt offended. Well, one, the adult shouldn't be offended. Two, if if I acknowledge you, look you eye to eye, that should have more value than me having physical contact. You know, that's right. So I truly I truly believe that if adults start changing that perspective of there's different ways of acknowledgement, then you can pay attention and see, oh, they acknowledge each other. Great. He didn't ignore them because ignoring, mm-hmm. yeah, that's rude. You know, you sure. don't want to totally be rude, but that's, it's just parents need to start changing that mindset and that frame of mind. And it's kind of like you were saying earlier, you feel that when you're around your family, it's safe. You mm-hmm. know, you feel that it's, it should be a comfortable way of doing, but when they start doing things of that's inappropriate, then that's mm-hmm. when people need to start speaking up. And one thing that I got from my last guest that went through that they said that it hurt them the most when when they told another adult they didn't believe them yeah that is something that we as adults need to start listening to children when they tell us something that could be unbelievable oh, because yeah. just because we have a perception of another adult an adult mindset doesn't take away the fact that that adult can be messed up mentally pervertedly that they think it's okay to do that mm-hmm. you know what i mean do- absolutely absolutely it's all about giving children their power back right <clears throat> giving them their power sure when you go to a family event. Hey, how are you? It's good to see you, you know, whatever. But I think we need to change the mindset that hugging and kissing isn't the only way to greet people. And you greet people 10 feet away if you want to. And I think you're absolutely right that that mindset needs to change. And and part of the reason is because of just what you said, you know, because sadly, you know, incest is very prevalent. It is. It's very prevalent. And nobody wants to say, oh, you know, it could be in my family. But it could be, and you just, you have to be on alert to that. And one thing I always say is if you have family members that, you know, I, I say, especially men in this way, if there's a guy who is just always volunteers to babysit your child, a man just wants to babysit your kid all the time, whether they're family members or not, that's a red flag. And, you know, women can also be abusers. And we know that women caretakers can also be abusers. And we also have to be careful with the female caregivers that we put in charge of our kids. And, you know, speaking of changing the mindset of how, you know, we greet people and giving children the option to not hug and kiss if they don't want to, giving them their power back. You know, there's also this thing that, with boys, they are so, it's like they're encouraged to be sexual. They're encouraged to lose their virginity at an early age. They're encouraged if they date a, a college girl and they're in high school, they're like, oh, wow, you're the man, right? Yeah. No, I'm sorry. A boy in high school shouldn't be dating a college girl. Right. You know, I mean, he's going to think he's the man because he doesn't realize that he's being taken advantage of. But by celebrating that, you're essentially celebrating your child being sexually abused. And, you know, so I want people to look at that from a different perspective as well, that our boys need to learn how to grow 
love and respect women, even when they don't want to just procreate with them. I'll put it that way. Yeah. no, You know, and not, you know, it's okay to show affection. It's okay to want to help people. It's okay to want to be a stay at home dad, if that's what you want. Right. But there's just this thing with boys is that, you know, when they're kids, they're like, oh, kid, go kiss your girlfriend. You know, they break an arm or a leg, you know, oh, don't worry. You're going to get so many girls from this. It's like, why are they just immediately putting that in these boys' heads instead of, you know, that just seems like it's the only thing that they focus on sometimes. It is. It truly is. And it's like, it's part of this macho mentality, this masculinity. Mm. It's really exasperating, to be honest, to deal with, because we are trying to create a new change of thought, a new change of movement, a new change of thinking. And the only way to do that is to test those boundaries, you know, to really expose yourself to different areas and different possibilities. And I think that's the best way because men have a bad rep. At the end of the day, men will always have a bad rep. I agree. The sign boys will be boys, men will be men is something that really needs to go away as well. You know, I was speaking with another individual talking about men sensitivity. Mm. And that's another thing that needs to be acknowledged and accepted as well as men being able to be sensitive and it's okay. Allow them to cry, allow them to, them to express their feelings. How come the girl can express themselves, but the guy can't? Mm-hmm. It makes no sense to me. No. But at the end of the day, we are all human beings experience emotions experiencing everything else what we use our privates for is personal and has no bounds to what how we should act or what we Mm -hmm. we should speak and how we should dress that makes no difference Mm -hmm. and I don't know why people obsess over that phenomenon that it needs to be obsessed about so I I absolutely agree I just don't get it no I don't get it either and it but it's one thing that is that's a thousand percent true is it's toxic it is It's toxic. I mean, I remember growing up. Now, I grew up in the deep south, okay, between Georgia and Alabama. Oh, okay. Yeah, you get there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So, you know, growing up there, it was like, boys don't cry. You're a sissy if, if you cry. You're a sissy if, you know, you get hurt and you don't just get up and, you know, dust it off, you know, that that's what they used to say, dust that off, you know, dust it off. It's going to be just fine. And it's so toxic and it's harmful to our boys. And that's why we have this problem with boys sexualizing girls all the time with boys being afraid to show their emotion. And what's happening is they're self-medicating. They are becoming abusers themselves, either sexually or physically. They do not treat women with respect and the love that they deserve. Yeah, it's a major problem that definitely needs to to be addressed. And I think where one place that it can start are these very gender specific things that we think should be, you know, only girls play with baby dolls, only boys play with trucks, right? No, you know, what's wrong with giving a boy a baby doll, teach him how to be how to care for another human, how to be, you know, gentle, compassionate, and maybe it'll teach him how to be a good father when he grows up. Maybe that will help him be a better father. And so what if a girl wants to play with a truck or, you know, maybe she wants to be an architect and she's into construction or, I mean, doesn't mean that she's going to turn out a lesbian or that's the other thing too, you know, yeah. you know going to be that whole thing, which is ridiculous, but, but yeah, so I think that's a place where it should start. Like pink is a color, blue is a color. It shouldn't be yeah. boys have to wear this color. Girls have to wear that color. That's very true. That's ugh, I do. I love your mindset. It's very open. Thank you. And mm-hmm. I believe a lot of people need to really start being, have that open mind. And I guess to get back to your book, <laughs> sorry, to got off topic. <laughs> oh no, I do that all the time. I never talk about my book when I do these (laughs) (laughs) how long did it take for you to feel that you were ready to share your story well it really wasn't until 2015 when I really realized that I needed to start therapy and I had known from the age of 10 that I was going to write a book I knew that just it was just crazy the things that I was experiencing and I knew I was going to call it the invisible girl because nobody ever did anything you won't find a news story or a police report on anything that's happened to me so that's why I felt invisible but it wasn't until probably I would say 2017 that I said okay now I'm ready now I'm ready to sit down and really start thinking about these things in more depth and really 
instead of just surface level, getting to how did I feel at that time? How do I feel now? Mm -hmm. How did it affect me then? How does it affect me now? Because I I just realized there were so many connections Mm -hmm. to things that happened to me as a child and the way that I would react to certain things as an adult. There are so many connections. I was like, oh my gosh, it's like a puzzle. More survivors need to know this. That no, that's part of it is breaking it down and really isolating things and digging in and self-examining and being introspective about what your part was in whatever it is that you're talking about, whether you didn't have a part at all, mm-hmm. but it's still important to say what you felt guilty about. That way you can correct it and say, wait a minute, no, why am I feeling guilty about that? Yeah. Or why am I feeling ashamed about that? Or why am I holding this guilt? This isn't my guilt. This belongs to this asshole over here. Part of my language, you know, that hurt me, <laughs> you know, that's who it belongs to. And I think so many survivors carry all of that. Like I did. And it got to a point where it was like a volcano that erupted and I just couldn't control it anymore. I became deeply depressed. And I, I mean, when I say depressed, I mean, I wasn't coming out of my room for days. I wasn't showering. I wasn't eating. I wasn't taking care of household chores. I mean, I was, and I had gone from this really successful sales career to all of a sudden, bam, not even being able to take care of my house or shower. Mm -hmm. And I said, I need to put this down and tell my story because I know so many people can relate to this. And it's a way to let them know that it's not all pretty. Even now, I still struggle with things. No, it it makes perfect sense. I think the biggest question I have, because I know that a lot of people who deal with these type of issues, the hardest thing to get them their mindset out of is a victim mindset. So Mm -hmm. how do you go from a victim to a survivor? You know what I mean? I I do. I feel like that's a big leap and a big step. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it really starts with putting the blame where the blame belongs. Mm. And where does the blame belong? Off of yourself and onto the person who hurt you. There you go. See, you heard it first from Yvonne. That's right. That's right. It starts by acknowledging that what was done to you was wrong. Mm -hmm. You didn't deserve it. And you really deserve to heal from it. You deserve to have those breakthroughs. You deserve to have that time to heal because it takes time. Nothing happens overnight, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Literally (laughs) nothing. Like I wish. Right. (laughs) Hocus pocus. Yes, exactly. I like that. (laughs) That is so true. And I thank you for speaking it and acknowledging it because I've spoken with people who still can't accept it. And it's hard and it's hard. I feel bad for them because they can't see that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. All they feel is the hovering and the shadow and just that energy, just and those memories coming back haunting them. And it truly breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because I don't think it's fair that they continue to live in that type of mind anymore. No, no, they don't deserve that. You know, they don't deserve to keep reliving the past. They don't deserve to to have to remain silent. Mm, They don't have to remain silent. You know, it starts with, I think, you know, just like I said, just acknowledging that you're not to blame because of my own experience, know what they're struggling with is, why did I go there? Why did I wear that? Yeah. Why was I drinking that night? Why, you know, why did I decide to, you know, be alone in a group of guys? Why did, you know, they're blaming themselves. And that's what they have to realize that it doesn't, none of those things mattered. It doesn't matter if they were walking down the street, but naked, Mm -hmm. no one has the right to put their hands on you. If you don't give them consent to, especially when you're a child. So I hope that people will hear this and recognize that they deserve it. They're worth it. And we're all in this together. And that's why I started my Survivor Strong podcast on Fireside was to talk to survivors. So I welcome all of them. It's a live podcast, by the way, which is really cool. 
That's ballsy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, know. Live. I can't do live because I would I think I would freeze up, but <laughs> you know what? You think that, but you don't. It's just like this. It's just like yeah. this. But you know, and I invite those to look that up on Fireside, Survivor Strong, and listen to other survivor stories. And when they're ready, just come on, listen, and you can it's very interactive. You can ask to come on camera and speak to me like this. It, you can stay off the camera and it's engaging and encouraging and it's a wonderful community that I welcome everyone to come check out. Awesome. Awesome. I believe this conversation has been truly helpful. I know that the ones that are going to be listening to this will really start a spark of change because I felt it, you know, I, oh, I good. miles away, but I truly felt your sincerity. I felt your yearning to want to help, you know, the realness of it, you know, and you can tell, you can tell when people yeah. sincerely want to help and when they're just in it for the wrong reasons and you are not in it for the wrong reasons. No. You are in it because you have dealt with this personally, you know, and when somebody has experienced something personally, then they can relate in a manner that literally nobody else can. Absolutely. And I just want to say this, that I am going to be traveling around to book festivals across the country. And, um, you know, so check out my website, www.theinvisiblegirlmemoir.com for updates. And that's actually an opportunity for survivors to sit down and talk with me face to face if they want to come out and see me then as well. Awesome. And I guess before we officially wrap up the show, uh -huh. what would be some good advice that you may have for myself or for the audience in general? You know, believe in yourself. Remember that you're not alone. Remember that you are capable of healing and it just takes one step. It takes one step at a time. Healing is a marathon, not a sprint. Be compassionate with yourself forgive yourself and love yourself more than anything because you deserve it. Mm -hmm. And just remember that we're all in this together. We're all in this together and you got this, got this. Awesome. See, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it first from Yvonne. I truly believe <laughs> what she says, you know, and it's really true. And I've said this in other podcasts before, you have to really forgive yourself for what you did not know. That's the mm -hmm. biggest thing for what you did not know. We are just yes. all learning as we go. And once you truly accept that as to be a fact for your life, that you are learning as you're going, then you can really start seeing your life differently and not looking back in your life and seeing past the events and being afraid or feeling all those negative emotions again you can look back and just say oh it was an experience you That's know right. because we are all just learning through our experiences so with that being said you'll find her beautiful picture on my website under my special guest you'll find her link to get to her website you'll be able to have access to her books access to her videos access to everything Yvonne <laughs> awesome I love it <laughs> thank you so much for having me of course have a good one y'all bye